Can you tell me about your life a little bit? Where were you born? How were you raised? I was born in... your interests, your education? Yeah, I was born in Harlan, Kentucky, in Appalachia. Small town, about 4,000 people. My mother was a social worker. She married a professional baseball player who was playing for a triple-A farm team for the New York Yankees. So he quit that, became a car salesman. They got divorced after three years. He left for uh, North Carolina with another woman, had another family. We saw him maybe three times in our life. So she raised us along with my grandmother and a black maid that we had who would come to do the washing and stuff in the day because my mother worked. My grandmother worked then too. And uh, I went to the University of Kentucky. Uh, my field was, I, I turned professional actor since I was 15 years old, the, younger, the youngest actor ever hired at the Barter Theater, State Theater of Virginia. And then uh, my degrees from the University of Kentucky are in theater and um, psychology. Then I went to Birkbeck in England, which is an extension of Cambridge, studied acting there. Came back to uh, Lexington, had a clothing store, um, lived in Seattle for like 15 years before I came here. But when I was about eight years old, uh, we'd go in the mountains, my brother and I all the time, we're just in the mountainous area. And I remember coming back down the mountain, I was too far in front of him, so I wanted to wait to let him catch up because he was only five. So I stood there, and while I'm standing there, I've always been a really quiet person. While I'm standing there, this voice says to me, look under your foot. Now, if I was in the city, I wouldn't pay attention to that because this is insane. But I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one can see me. So I, I heard this voice, look under your foot. I'm like, no one can see me, so I can go ahead and make a fool of myself and look under my foot. All right, I'll look under my foot. And I looked under my foot, and there was a top round part of a stone. That's okay. Look under your foot. All right. So I start digging this rock up with my foot. I didn't want to actually lean down because I felt like a fool. But I'll, okay, I'll appease this voice and I'll look under my foot. So finally I got enough out and I reached down and I pulled it up and it was a geode. You know a geode? A geode? A geode. No. So half the stone you can see, you pull it up, and the other half is all crystals. Incredible. Wow, that was real. So I had things happen to me like that for a long time, all my life. When I was in Seattle, I ran a climbing footwear distributor from Italy. We sold climbing shoes for climbing mountains. And I was a U.S. distributor, so my partner couldn't deliver all the orders for all the stores. So he called me and said, basically, we're out of business. Will I be okay? I said, yeah, I have another company. I'll be all right. So my warehouse manager was my good friend Thomas. He brought over a bottle of wine, and we had a glass. And I was going back to the kitchen to get another glass. And he said, so what are you going to do now? And I turned around, and I said, I'm going to the Amazon. And that's what his expression was the same. And I went, and I went, huh? So I sat down. He said, you're doing what? I'm going to the Amazon. He said, what for? I said, I don't know. I was a photographer, too. And on the way to the airport in Seattle, I'm flying to Arizona. I had the driver stop at uh, a mag magazine store to get something to read on the plane. And when I, woke, I opened the door, and it was like a lightning bolt, shaman's drum. I'm like, what? Shaman's drum. Now, normally, it w I would buy, like, Time magazine or Golf Digest, something. Sh I never read stuff like this. I, okay, I'll buy that. So I bought this. I got on the plane and started reading it. I read an article about ayahuasca and shamanism, written by Peter Gorman, who now is my best friend. So that was like, okay. So that started me on the path coming down here, and I had all these things that happened to me that said, go on, and there were like all these things you cannot believe. But it's in my book, which is out now. It's called Ayahuasca Medicine by Alan Shoemaker. It's in every English-speaking bookstore in the world now. How did you come here? I mean, you were, why, why were you in... Ecuador, did I was in Quito, but every time I looked at a map, it would go, Iquitos, Iquitos. And I'm like, I've never even heard of Iquitos, but I just kept, I could go, Iquitos. I said, okay, okay. So I had to go back over the Andes to Colombia, over the Andes and down to Puerto Asís, the headwaters of the Putumayo River. It took two weeks to find a dugout canoe. It was 15 meters long, and I got a 40-horsepower motor and rebar to make a top. And four 55-gallon drums of gasoline and food and took off. And that canoe was really fast with the 40 horsepower. It's like a cigarette boat. So uh, up to Igarapurana, I lived with the Boris. I stopped along the way and drank with uh, Cordenderos, Ayahuasqueros. 
When I came here, there were no tourists for ayahuasca. Uh, my first teacher, as I told you, was in the Andes, and that was working with San Pedro, and he was a doctor from Austria, neurosurgeon psychiatrist. He's incredible. Uh, I came down by dugout canoe until I got to Leticia, and I was brought here, and I found my first teacher, Don Juan Tango of Paima. We had ceremonies typically on Tuesdays and Fridays is when they run ceremonies here. Outside of his house, he lives close to the airport, not far from me now. The only people coming to those ceremonies were Peruvians. And it's donation only. You can't put a price on this. But I'm living there, and he's got seven kids. So these people were working and cooking the ayahuasca and going out into the jungle and collecting the ayahuasca and coming back and cooking it. And he's got all these kids, and they can't eat. So it's, I'm, I'm having to pay my own money. And I said, Juan, look, I need to, like, you need to charge these people. So you cannot charge. It's donation only, Alan. That's, that's the life of the Cordendero. I said, well, then they tell them to bring a chicken or something, get something when they come. Because, one, it's time for school. And I paid the last time, and I've got new books and new shoes. and new You need to be making some money from your work, Juan. So you should be charging people. What I wonder, in, in the old times when donations were expected by the healer, by the curandero, is yeah. the, were those donations uh, generous? Typically, what they do is they bring you a pack of cigarettes. And you can go see a curandero here from Brazil. He's a friend of mine, Javier. And when I go see him, Alan, would you like something? He pulls up a big plastic trash bag. Alan, you, you want a pack of cigarettes? And the cigarettes are always Caribbean because those are the ones are, that are smuggled in from Brazil and they cost like four soles a pack. So they buy the cheapest pack of cigarettes there is so they can say they gave a gift to the curandero because if you don't give something, it's difficult to receive. So typically they give you this. But then from time to time you get people that have some money and someone needs a special healing, uh, like their mother is sick or something, and they do ceremonies for their mother and the mother's not even present and the mother gets well. And the people are like, wow, that's, that's really amazing because we've seen all these doctors. But I saw this ayahuasquero, he did a ceremony for my mother, and she's well. And I happen to have like 2,000 solis because I was going to save it for the doctor, but she's healthy now, so they give it to the curandero. So yeah, there's people that will, have, will give you money. There's also people that just don't have the money. 60 to 65% of the people here are out of work. And that's official work. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have a machete and they're going out and cutting someone's front lawn and pick up five solis. But as far as like an official job working in a store, no. The first time I ran a ceremony out of the States was in Sebastopol. I was invited by a woman I met up in Tomshiaco. I get there and there's like 12 people. And I was, because I was working with donation only too. But here, I mean, I've flown up and I've got to eat and I've got to rent a car. So I put it, I'll do a donation box. And guess what? If you give the people the opportunity not to pay you, they won't. And the other thing that happens is that if you put too low of a price on it, they don't respect what you're doing. So you have to find that place where it's enough money where they're going to feel like, yes, okay, I'm paying for something and I want to get this experience. Uh, and not like way too much like $200, $300, which people all do also in New York and in California. So it's got to be some sort of like balance there. Uh, what do you think about all this brujería, you know? Um, no, I don't believe in that. Keep, keep talking about it. No. What do you it's, think about this brujería? It's a way to frighten people so that you will do what they tell you to do. So if you're, they get you so frightened and scared about brujos and brujería that you only will listen to them, you will only trust in them. But you also find other lodges that have been built here by gringos and they use the brujería thing to frighten all their passengers that come here. So they all take like 30, 40 people every three weeks and they say, look, when you come back, I can only guarantee that this place is safe because there's a lot of brujeria out there and you can wind up in another place that's got brujos and you can have viroti shot into your body. You could have, uh, you can be attacked psychically. You could be raped physically. Uh, all kinds of things could happen. But this place, you know, is safe, so only come back here. And that's a way of them keeping up with their client, clientele. So another thing they have a tendency to do is to say, oh, I saw you in ceremony last night and I heard you sing. You, you have a gift. And I think that if you would stay here with me like a year, I can teach you to be an ayahuasquero. You have it, I see it. So what happens there? Everyone comes here and they, they think, everyone believes that they're, they've got some sort of gift to become a shaman, quote, shaman, which the word doesn't even belong in this culture. And so when the shaman, and you have an incredible experience in the ceremony, and the shaman the next day says that you have this gift, and you go, I knew I, I knew I had it. I knew I could do this. I was supposed to come here. I was supposed to meet him or her. I would, and so I'm going to go home and I'm going to sell my house. Actually, I'm going to go divorce my husband because I know that he loves me because he touched me last night. And, uh, 
and I'll come back here and I'll become, you know, the shaman's wife. And then I'll learn from him and I'll become a shaman myself. That, that shit happens all the time. That happens all the time? All the time. And what is the purpose? The purpose is money. It's the Cordendale Ayahuasquero, convincing someone that they have this gift, that they can bring it out of them. But give me your money and come stay with me for a year, and you will be a Cordendale like I am. And that's pretty common. And they get, yes. And everyone will fall for that line. You're incredible. I saw you last night. I saw the future with working with you. And so, but you need to work with me. You need to diet. Come stay with me for a year. And they say, well, I can only do like four months. You know, I, I work. I can do four months. Well, you need four months and then go home and come back. But it's going to take like a year or two. It's going to prolong it. But if you can stay for a year, I can make you an ayahuasquero. And incredible. And it's such an ego thing. And the whole thing about drinking ayahuasca is to get rid of your ego so you can hear the spirits talk to you. You can see the spirits. And, but you have to get your ego out of the way. And that's all about feeding someone's ego, making them believe they can be an ayahuasquero. And, uh, you know, as much as I wanted to when I was younger, I took three years of piano lessons. But when I realized my hands just do, I can't, don't have the reach and I don't have the gift to be a classical pianist and tour. It's, it's a talent. And to be able to have contact with the spirit world and interact with the spirit world and the spirit will allow you to help other people that are ill, that's a gift. It's not something that you, you can train to be. You can train to become a facilitator, someone that knows how to run a ceremony, how, someone that knows how to set the space, to put your mind in the right place. But uh, as far as like becoming like a hollow bone, which is what you want to do, you get your ego out of the way so that they can talk and they can work through you, uh, that's not, not, not everyone can do that. However, there are, this is an interesting thing happening here, is all these gringos coming and, yeah. and putting up uh, lodges and albergues yeah. with the maestro. What do you think of all this movement? It's an interesting experiment because I see as many albergues as I see, they, they come here and drink for like two or three weeks and they think, oh well, I've got some money, I'm going to come here with this coordinator, he's got some land. We'll buy the land and then we'll build an albergue. And uh, no one comes. So maintenance on a, on a maloca or on a bird, everything's wood and thatch leaves, so things rot. So there's a lot of maintenance costs. And you have to have a guardian, and you have to pay the cordendero, and you have to have a lot of the sheets, the beddings, the linens, the food, everything, a boat. So it's very expensive. But if you don't have the other side set up, if it's like, if I build it, they will come, and they don't come. So as many that get built, as many also that fall to the wayside and become destroyed from lack of use and lack of more money. Uh, the other thing that happens is that a cordendero will have, say, a woman come drink with him, and he gives the same line of how incredible she is, and they become lovers. And so she goes home and sells her stuff and comes back down. He has land, so it needs to be purchased. So she uses her money. The deal is that she would build the thing, and they would work together. Uh, but they don't go to immigration and realize they should have a stamp put in their passport which allows them to sign contracts. So they don't tell them that. So anything that she signed as far as contracts and buying land is all null and void and she, there's nothing she can do about it. She was taken advantage of. And that, that has happened? Are That's you talking happened. about Several times. real things? Yes, I'm talking about real people. And so the other part is that uh, you don't have the marketing crew set up in the States or in Europe once you've got something built here. So you just believe that you build an ayahuasca center, that people are going to come to you. But it's not that simple. It doesn't take many people to leave with a bad experience and get on the internet and start talking about, I went to that place, whatever name you want to call it. And uh, the ayahuasca was loaded with toe, datura. Uh, we tripped for like 12 hours. Your mouth is really dry. Your lips get really dry. Um, it's complete hallucinations. There's no visions whatsoever. And the worst part about that is that if you make it back fine and you're 100%, that you can remember maybe about one-third of everything that you saw. So the people that don't know how to cook these ayahuasqueros, and they want to make sure that the gringo has a very visual experience, they will add a lot of toe. There's another place up here that they dose you with chiric sinango all the time. Well, chiric sinango has the same alkaloids in it as toe, datura, scopolamine. And so they put it in your food, they put it in your drinking supply. So you've got people at this compound walking around literally like zombies. And the two people that I know, they're from Canada, they escaped 
but they, the, from the first drink that they were given, the Church of Nangle Diet, they did that. They felt what that was. They didn't want to do that anymore. But they couldn't come down. So they finally could keep it together enough to realize that they're being dosed. It's in the food, it's in the water supply. It's keeping air, and they're looking around, and everyone's literally walking around like zombies, and they're following orders of what the Cordendale is telling them to do. And that typically means that if you stayed for two weeks, you need to stay for two months. I can work on your problem and I can turn you into a great Iowa ghetto, but you have some psychological problems, some spiritual problems you need to work on. You need to stay longer, which means give me your credit card. You can't come into town, what's your credit card? I'll use your card, come in and get the money, I'll give me the code. That happens. You think people is coming for the experience or people know that this is a healing thing and, and, and it's coming for healing? Generally, they, uh, they don't have touch with uh, their souls. They've gone to churches, they're Baptist, they're Catholic, they're Jewish, they're whatever. And somehow that part of the religious experience uh, has done nothing for them at all. And so they want, they want to be in touch with their, their soul, their spirit. And they've heard a lot about it, they've read about it, but they don't feel it, they can't sense it. But they've read that see ayahuasca can bring to this place. As well, some have emotional issues they want to deal with. Some have uh, childhood issues that happened, maybe they were uh, abused. And some just are looking for enlightenment in general. And some have physical problems. And they're looking to shamanism because the Occidental medicine has not solved their problem. So they come here for various reasons. And many come because in the back of their mind, they know that somehow, some way, they're supposed to be a healer. And uh, this can be the fast road to that if you're the one, and not many are. But to become a facilitator is a great place to be. You're capable of cooking the medicine. You're capable of running ceremonies, of controlling energies during a ceremony, using incense. You've learned a bunch of Icaros. And that in itself will turn other people on to wanting to come down to see the real experience in the jungle. Actually, ayahuasca is not, it's not the medicine itself, you know, in this medical system. It's just the, the tool the masters use to find what the medicine is and what are the plants that have to be given to the patient, yeah. right? More than ayahuasca being a medicine itself. Although, of course, it can be a, a cleaning, that's the reason they call it the purga. Uh -huh. um, and, and, well, I would like you to reflect about that, because uh, outside, uh, ayahuasca is thought to be the medicine, right? Well, the medicina, the sagrado, the sacred medicine. Yeah, absolutely. But because it is la purga, the purgative, and you will vomit and you will have diarrhea, most likely. Uh, that purge in itself can be incredible and, and because you're believing so much that this is the medicine that you're taking, whatever Ill physical illnesses or even emotional illnesses or spiritual illnesses you may have can be taken completely away because your mind, we all know that the mind is the most incredible medicine there is. That's why when you do double blinds with new medicines that come out, there's that placebo effect. So even though you've got 20 people here that are taking the medicine that you made, and 20 people are taking the placebo, no one knows what they're taking. But the person taking the placebo really believes they're taking the medicine, and they get healed. So that really screws up the results and the data about what is this medicine really doing. Well, see, ayahuasca is doing the same thing. And a lot of stuff about shamanism, too, is that's why when you want to, you want to see a healer, a shaman, a curandero, ayahuasquero, you want to find someone, man or woman, that's very charismatic and very sensitive because that will make the medicine stronger and you be, believe it much more. So if he's looking at healing you of a physical illness or whatever, he sees you during ceremony and you're having visions of uh, queens and kings and spirits and Jesus and whatever you're having. And so the next day he says to you that I brought this plant from the jungle. I saw last night what will heal you. And he could give you at least from say um, uh, the papaya tree. It, would be, it wouldn't matter, or some strange plant you've never even seen. But he's so convincing, so charismatic, and so reassuring that this is the plant you need to take. You boil this up as a tea three times a day and take it half an hour before meals. And uh, don't eat any sugar, no, no gaseosa. And do this every day for like four weeks, and your illness will go away. And you are so believing that actually, see, the placebo effect comes into play there. Do you think the placebo effect takes place in this kind of Absolutely, healing? absolutely. And it's essential. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge percentage part of shamanism, this placebo. The belief of the patient that the shaman will heal? Absolutely, yeah. So the more charismatic, 
the man is, the better or the woman, and the more beautiful the ikaros, whether they're sung or played on a harmonica or whistled or whatever. And your set, your mindset, and the setting of where you are, how you clean the space with Palo Santo, which is an incense made from Hollywood Palo Santo. It smells incredible. Uh, and your whole treatment. So it's the whole, it's the whole package. And the better the person can handle that, the more likely you are to receive the kind of healing that you want. Because if it's not really coming from the plant that he gave you, it's coming from your own mind. The plants that the shaman will give to, to uh -huh. the patient, uh -huh. do, do they have therapeutic properties? Do Absolutely. Or not? Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. For instance, cat's claw, unia de gato, is, it's incredible anti-inflammatory. It raises your immune system. It's anti-tumor, anti-cancer. Uh, my mother had hepatocellular cancer and had two months to live. And I did a ceremony with Juan, my old teacher. I'd finished working with him. And I had Peter Gorman with me. We were trying to see what caused this cancer. And after the ceremony, I said, OK, I see it. My mother, she's taking pills to lower her cholesterol. And that works in the liver. And she's got liver cancer, deadly liver cancer. So we drank again like two nights later. And I'm looking to see, OK, what, what medicine? So you get yourself out of the way. She can be fed information. And so we walked out of there, and I said, Peter, did you get some? He said, yeah, I got uni de gato. Said, yeah, I got uni de gato and here goes Satya. So I flew home about three days later with these dried plants, walked into my mother's house and said, Mother, I hadn't seen her in seven years. You're taking a pill to lower your cholesterol? She said, well, I was. The doctor said not to take it anymore. I said, yes, because that's what caused your cancer. OK, so let me, you got to drink this tea. So I showed her how to make the tea, and I stayed there a week, and I left. And I had to go to Flagstaff, and I was touring, doing ceremonies. I get back to Flagstaff about a month later, and there's a voicemail on the machine that says, Alan, please call me. She had two months to live. I'm like, oh, no. So I called her, and she said, look, Alan, I went in to see the doctors, and they opened me up, and they were going to remove as much of my liver as they could because it will grow back. But the cancer had reduced down to the size of a thumbnail, so they clipped that off and threw it out. Yeah. I had... Uh, I was doing ceremonies in London, and I got a call from these older women. They were like 65 to 70 years old, like 10 of them. They wanted me to come down south and do a ceremony for them, and they never had ayahuasca before. They had heard about me from an article I wrote in Shamanstrom, and they had traced where I was, and they found me in London, and they called me. So I take the train down there, get to their house, and when I always go where I'm doing ceremonies, I always take the plants with me, and I teach people how to cook. And by doing that, I say, you can do this. You can buy these plants legally. Now I'll show you how to cook. So you can have your own ceremonies. You can be facilitators. You can put on some nice music, clean your space, and you can continue drinking this medicine. Medicine. So during the ceremony, I go around to each woman. They're sitting around the walls, on the floor, the rugs. And I said, are you on any kind of contraindicated medicines? What are, you, are you taking anything? No. You? No. You, I'm taking this. That's OK. Are you taking it? No. And, but the last woman was leaning up on the front door, or back. and I'm. And I, and I stopped, and as I stopped, it was like I was being fed. I said, okay, is there something you're not telling me? I didn't say the same line, because I was, there's something you're not telling me? She said, well, yeah, um, uh, one of my kidneys shut down when I was like 13 years old. And I said, well, you know, you're like 65 now, so. She goes, well, actually, the other one's full of cysts. And see, I have this medicine in my hand. Am I going to give this to her or not? She so wait to be fed. OK, yeah, you drink this. So we had a good ceremony. The next day I left, I went to Solothurn, I went to Germany, I was doing ceremonies. About a month later, I get back to London. And I'm flying back to Lima the next day. And this woman calls the place I'm staying. And the woman says, Alan, you have a phone call. And the woman that had the problems with the kidneys, Alan, I wanted to talk to you before you left. I went to see my doctor. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, look, the kidney that shut down when I was 12 or 13, it starts working again. And the cysts are gone from the other one. So that's an instance where ayahuasca actually is the medicine. Yeah? So it can be, it can do, it does a lot of things. It's magic. But also, once you know about the spirit world, it's way, way, way beyond religion, because what you learn in, from religion is that read this book and have faith that what we're telling you is true. Faith drives people bonkers. Just give me your 10% of your money, 
and have faith that what I'm telling you about God and Jesus and whatever it is you want to believe in is true. But when you start working with plants like ayahuasca and the other sacred power plants, and you actually see the spirit world, and they come and talk to you, and you can interact, and you do what they tell you to do, and it has the reaction that someone gets healed, then you know that this other reality is even more real than we are here in this body. Because we are souls after all, and we're here only on a short holiday to be able to use this physical form, to be able to eat food, interact with people, have sex. It's a vacation. Did you finally become a, a, well, a curandero? Well, my first experience was with uh, drinking to see what was wrong with my mother, and then flying up with the medicine, and then seeing that it worked. So what I was told, what I was given through ceremony, that she should take Unia de Gato and Cat's Claw and Hergon Satya was real. Uh, and then from there, you get people coming to you and with odd things. And I've, I've worked with like 200 people here with diabetes type 2. There's five plants that we give them. I tell them to stop taking their meds, take these plants, make a tea three hours, three times a day. Uh, the diet's no carbs and no sugar in any form. No uh, light gaseosis. There's no such thing because your body believes that that uh, saccharin is sugar, so it responds to it that way too. So. And in 24 hours, your blood sugar is normal. And it's an eight week program. You're going to lose weight. You're not going to get up and pee like six times a night. That's why diabetics are so tired. Every morning they can't sleep. The wounds on your feet are going to heal up. The erectile dysfunction comes back. So I did that for years. And then you get people, I've got several people off their meds for uh, bipolar. They were taking SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And this is all over the internet. And this is not really shamanism, just having the knowledge about the plants. And I say, look, have you ever heard of maca? It's from the Andes. And maca, well, if you stop taking your stuff and start taking the maca, in about a week to 10 days, you'll start feeling the effect. And the effect is that you're going to feel really good. You won't need your bipolars anymore. You're not bipolar. They've told you this stuff. That's dangerous medicines. And so with the three people in the last year that I got them off, they all wrote me back and said, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I love it. I feel great. I've got more energy, vitality. And I said also, yeah, the secondary effect is that it increases your sexual libido. So I hope you have someone that you can, like, you know, make love with because that, that's, a good, that's a good thing for adults like my age, like 60 years old, to do as well because we lose a lot of that testosterone that we had when we were, like, 17 to 25. Do so you think ayahuasca is aphrodisiac? Yeah, I think it, yeah. And I think the whole thing about no salt, no sugar, no oil, and no sex was made up. That's b b absurd diet. Do you think that La Madre Ayahuasca would be upset with you making love, not having sex, but making love with someone you're in love with while you're under her influence? No. Love is the place you want to come to. That's where all the healing comes in. So if you get to that place of complete awakening about everything, that's, that's the space of complete love. That's healing. And the way they typically drink here is this, the traditional way is in the back, on every given city block in Iquitos, there's probably two ayahuasqueros that live there. And on Tuesday and Fridays, they hold ceremony in the back of their house on a dirt floor, completely darkness. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And they all have buckets and they throw up there and they drink the stuff and they drink it to keep their body clear. And sometimes people have some visions and stuff. But they drink it primarily to clean their body out. Toxins. They're not, the gringos are drinking it because they want to have a vision. Because they've read articles in Shaman's Drum or Magical Blend or books, whatever, like I've read or Peter Gorman's um, written or Peter Gorman's written or McKinnon's or whoever. And uh, if I've had ayahuasca like 2,000 times, if, if I wrote about the 1,600 times I drank ayahuasca and I just purged and I saw the little colors, who's going to publish that? So what Timothy White would publish in Shaman's Drum were the most incredible experiences I ever had. And those, that's what everyone wants. And they come here and they want that vision. And I say, look, if the vision was in that bottle of ayahuasca, I would have it running as an IV 24 hours a day. I can't promise you you're going to get a gift like that. But you will get good ayahuasca, and it's good cleansing for you. But as far as a, a vision, I, that's not up to me. Don't you think people uh, get disappointed? People coming, tourists coming, because they expect that, as you say, they expect these bright color visions. Yeah. Um, um, most of them, you know, don't don't see anything at all. Yeah. It's dark and it's it's unpleasant. They yeah. are purging all the time. <laughs> I don't know, you it's, know, everyone would like to see that absolutely. you have on yes. your back, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. but they don't. No, no, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, but most of them are like still, you know, I had some incredible uh, meditative uh, communications with my most profound self. I realized some things about myself that I, that I needed to really bring to light. Uh, 
I recall being abused as a child and I'd completely forgotten that it had been shut down and I was raped by my father many times. That could be a man or woman saying that. And those kinds of things, yeah. So, it, yeah, it brings up a lot of things for them. So it clears out a lot of stuff. So, and, and sometimes you get really lucky and you get to interact with the world like this. What is the importance of the vision in the, well, in the whole you know, of the medicine? Uh, well, by giving you, like, you, it takes the faith away. You don't have to have faith anymore because you know we're not, we're not here for very long. There is another dimension. There are several dimensions. One of the effects of this business around ayahuasca is that it's more difficult every time to find the, the vine. You know, I mean, it's, it's more expensive. And it's, it's, I have met some people that are bringing ayahuasca and they have to go very far to the Napo River and to other places. To, to find the vine and the, right. the leaves. What do you, what do you, can, 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 can you do Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a shame on the local ayahuasqueros that they haven't been replanting because this has been going on for years. So instead of just replanting, it takes like three years, you're ready to harvest. And it, it, you stick anything in the ground here, you don't have to have a green thumb, it's going to grow. So uh, they're not replanting. So instead, they're hiring their people, go up, you now they go up to Rio Marignon or Rio Ucayali, like five days to get it, to come back down here, to bring it to them. Instead of like, every time they get some stuff in, go out in your own jungle where you are and plant more stuff, because it's going to be ready in three or four years. If you've got a lot of, a lot of stuff planted, then so I have pl stuff planted all over my property. I've been doing that for years. I've got Charlie Pongo, which is Wambisa, which is Diplopsis cabrana, Chacruna, Ayahuasca, Negro, Rojo, Cielo, Thunder. Uh, you don't buy? I buy two when I get a good deal. The last time I bought was five rolls. They usually sell it in costals, the big white bags or black bags. How much did you pay for every costal? The costals used to cost 50. Now they're 120 soles. Yeah. Uh, but see, I can buy them from Bucalpa in a big roll, which is almost like two costals. And they put it on a ship for 50 soles and bring it here to me. Or I can harvest from my own property if I want to. But I prefer not to touch my own stuff and let it get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. When I'm able to buy it, I'll buy it and not touch my own stuff. What is the danger, in your opinion, of, of the ayahuasca medicine system uh, becoming part of the capitalistic system, which wasn't uh, until a, a few decades ago, it wasn't part of this economic system, now it is. That's something that's bound to happen. And so there's going to be some uh, ayahuasqueros, curanderos, that will go down that path of capitalism. And once they do that really strongly, they're going to lose any kind of power that they ever had because they're going after the dollar. So eventually people will stop going to them because they don't have any, anything to give. Now it becomes obvious that they're in this for the money. And I'll have to tell you too that I'm in it for the money too. This is what I do. I'm a professional and I have two children that are raised and I put them in school and I have to eat and they have school books and they have some, so I have to make a living too. So I charge but my prices are low. It's like the old Sion Cordendero told me on the Putumaya River after that ceremony we traded harmonicas. He said, you know what the legend is? I had no idea. He said, well, it's a 1,000 year legend, Alan. And this is in the middle of nowhere, right? Siona tribe. The legend is that it was 500 years ago that the conquistadors came here and put us all into hiding and killed us and took away our medicines, all kind of stuff. But now it's the second part of the clock the next 500 years and the legend is that the new shaman the new curandero will be the gringo because the gringo will come here with knowledge about occidental medicine and want to get the knowledge from this medicine here the traditional medicine the ayahuasca and those things because alan my grandson my son and his grandson they don't want to know nothing that i have they don't want to learn but the gringos come here and they want to know they want to know about the healing and that's unfortunate. But guess what's happened with all the tourism that's come down? Because the gringos are coming in and they're going to every little tributary and they're looking for someone undiscovered. And they go there and they find someone and they treat that father or mother, Cordendero, with so much respect. And the whole family sees that. And then they come back and they bring two or three more gringos with them. And they're all giving them respect. And they drink ayahuasca. And they eat dinner with them. And they eat breakfast with them. And they go swimming. They teach them how to, they're teaching them how to fish for piranha, they walk into the jungle and show them plants. And they're so graced to have this knowledge be bestowed on them. And then they pay. So when school starts again, the children go to their grandfather or their mother or father, whoever it is. Here, go get your school books, your shoes. 
So now they come back and they say, I want to learn. I want those gringos to respect me. I want to learn from you. Teach me. And that's what's happening with tourism. Really? You yeah. have seen that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's enough for me. Yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, that was good. A final reflection? No, you got enough there.